I'm going to talk about the delayed flight time method of mating control. This is something that I think can be useful uh, in conservation of breeding. I think that many of you are engaged in the conservation of uh, the dark bee in a very practical manner. So maybe you will find this technique useful. It's a technique that can help you to, well, perform controlled matings if you don't have access to a mating station or uh, if you're not technically capable or you do not have the facilities are required to do artificial insemination. So this is the outline of my talk. Uh, first, I will very briefly uh, recapitulate recap uh, the biological problem behind mating control in honeybees. This is something you're all familiar with, I suppose. I will then talk about the principle of the delayed flight time mating, which is also called moonshine mating. I think actually in the announcement of this talk, it was called moonshine mating, which is of course more romantical, but less precise, less correct. So we're talking here of delayed flight time mating. Then I will show what experiments we did to validate this method, which is actually very old. It dates from the uh, late 1800s. So it's a uh, really, uh, it was developed very early in, uh, in beekeeping, but it has rarely been scientifically validated. And I think this is the reason why it has not been widely accepted so far. Then uh, I will also touch on economical considerations because I suppose that many of you are professional or semi-professional beekeepers, so you might want to know how much it costs. And finally, I want to conclude on, well, the potential utility that I or that we see in this method. So the biological problem behind uh, mating control in honeybees is of course that natural mating requires free flight. It only occurs in great altitudes above 10 meters usually. And uh, it occurs in central congregation areas. This means that uh, the drones and queens from a huge area are gathering there and there's a huge, a, a huge amount of intermixture if you do not prevent it by active measure taking. So it's, um, this is the problem that actually we're, we're set to solve here. And there's a third uh, aspect to this problem that is that there is multiple mating in the honeybee of course. And so if you want to be sure that a mating is pure, well, you have to be sure that 10 or 14 drones are all of the right origin, which is of course more tricky than having just one bull, which is the right bull who's fathering your calf if you're breeding cattle. So what happens if you do not practice mating control? Uh, if you're doing directional breeding, so you're breeding for a, for a, for a breeding for a, a, a special economic trait like uh, disease resistance or honey production, the thing is that you will have very slow genetic progress. And there is a, uh, at the time he used to be a PhD student, now he's already a postdoc in our lab who has actually modeled what happens if you do not practice controlled mating in directional breeding. What you, what you have here on the Y axis is a rather abstract uh, value uh, giving the genetic response to selections, so, uh, the uh, success that you will have in improving your genotype by selecting your animals. And here is the years that you're practicing your selection program. Of course, there's a whole lot of other uh, considerations entering into this model that I will just pass above. But what you can clearly see here is that if you practice controlled mating, you will have a great, a far greater um, genetic response to your selection work than if you're not doing un uh, controlled mating. Of course, if you uh, use uncontrolled mating, uh, there's still a difference uh, uh, whether you have a, a huge population surrounding your breeding population, so many uh, animals that could interfere with your uh, breeding drones and queens or whether you have a small surrounding population. So that is why uh, the inclination of these curves uh, is, is variable depending on the size of the surrounding population. But there is always a huge 
difference between controlled mating and uncontrolled mating. It's really, really important if you want to do uh, directional selection. And even in conservational selection, where you're not, not actually looking at genetic progress, you're just looking to preserve what you already have. This is also much easier if you have controlled mating, of course. Otherwise, you have to select among the descendants of your matings, which is a lot of work. So, of course, there are already uh, at least two uh, methods of mating control which work fine. One is artificial insemination. Uh, I'm sure um, many of you practice it. But if you practice it, then you will know that it is quite expensive. You need specialized equipment in the form of a microscope, of an insemination apparatus. You need, you need this, these dilutes in order to uh, fill your syringe. You need the syringe, of course. Uh, and it's also really hard to reconcile with other beekeeping tasks because uh, normally if you come in from the bee yard, your hands tend to tremble because you perform some, some bodily labor and then you sit down to do the insemination and you will find your hands are just trembling too much. So it's also time-wise, it's really hard to reconcile with, with normal beekeeping in my experience. And also, of course, it requires some skill and some practice and uh, having uh, performed or having trained inseminators at our institute for a couple of years now, uh, I can tell you that not everybody is capable of learning it. Most people are, but not everybody is. Then there's another method of uh, mating control that is very much in use, of course, and that's the conventional mating stations. Uh, but of course, conventional mating stations also have limitations. They're really great because you can mate many queens uh, with relatively little effort once you have set up the mating station. But the problem is uh, there aren't so many locations where you can actually do a mating station because locations need to be either isolated or you have to make sure that all the beekeepers in a huge area have the right kind of genetic material, which is not, which is not easy. It's a lot of logistical work. And there's another disadvantage to conventional mating stations, and that is that usually there's only one father per mating station. So if you want to do uh, a couple of crossings in your uh, breeding scheme, uh, well, you're limited in your choice because on one mating station, normally there are only male descendants of one grandmother queen. So uh, you're, you're rather limited in the choice of uh, paternal material that you're using. So we thought it might be a good idea to come up with a third method of mating control. As I said, it's not actually that we came up with it, just we wanted to validate it and we wanted to spread the idea. And this is the moonshine mating concept or delayed flight time concept. Uh, and we did this in a research project that was funded by the German Federal Ministry of Agriculture. And we did it in cooperation with the beekeeping association from our region, the region of Brandenburg, and of the Black Bee Breeders, uh, one of the Black Bee Breeding, breeding Associations in Germany, which is Zuchtverband Dunkle Biene Deutschland. I'm sure you know. So now we finally come to the principle of moonshine mating. I'm sure you're all aware of, of it in, uh, in principle, you have heard of it. So while free mating uh, is normally taking place uh, between 1 p.m. and around 5 p.m., uh, your breeding queens and drones will only be allowed to fly a little later. So they will only be allowed from, say, half past five in the afternoon when all the wild flying, the free flying drones have already returned to their hives. So they will not encounter any of these uncontrolled, potentially undesirable drones. They will only encounter the drones that you foresaw for them. So at present, there are two uh, versions of this moonshine mating or delayed flight time technique uh, implemented. Uh, one is in Greece. Uh, it's called. It's also called the train of virgin queens. Uh, the lady who's 
uh, guiding this is Fanny Hajina. And actually, when we started our project, Fanny helped us a lot. He, she gave us a lot of ideas. And uh, so we're really adapted to Fanny for everything that we did. Here's a picture of what she did. So she has a like a, a building, a cooled building, where all the uh, mating nukes are brought to uh, while they're not allowed to fly, while the queens are supposed to stay inside. And uh, the hives are pulled out of this cooling facility uh, every evening or every afternoon in order to allow the queens to be mated. And then they're pushed in again. And then she posted some nice flower pots here in order to help the queens orient, of course. So the aims of our project were to quantify the mating efficiency and the mating purity. This is something that has almost never been done before. Even Fanny has only done it partially. And uh, the second big uh, aspect of our work was actually to make it easier and to simplify it and to reduce the workload involved with it. And we did that at two different scales. We uh, thought it would be nice to have a solution for every individual beekeeper because especially this, uh, the, the breeders of dark bees, usually they have very, very small operations and it was meant like uh, a special support for the dark bee breeders, although of course it's also suitable for all other races. <clears throat> so we wanted to have one solution for individual beekeepers or very small scale breeders. And we, then we also wanted to have one larger scale solution, which would be more suitable for associations or groups of breeders. So this small solution, uh, we first tested it in the bee yard of one breeder of the dark bee in a location uh, which is called Priod in Brandenburg in our land in Germany. And as I said, the objectives were to have a simple and cheap method, uh, which is easy to replicate and which is functional even in the presence of great numbers of foreign drones. So there is no geographical isolation needed. You can do it wherever you are and whatever bees your neighbor is keeping. Actually, you can even have other bees than the bread material on your own apiary if you want. Um, and this small solution, so this solution that we tested in this beekeeper's apiary, we did it in two variants again. And one variant was with cooling. Uh, if you remember what I showed you before, the picture of Fanny's method, Fanny also used cooling. She used a building, a cooled building, a cooled facility to bring her mating nukes to. Um, and one version is uncooled because we thought that actually this cooling is right bothersome. And also some uh, experienced moonshiners in Germany told us that actually cooling is not needed if you perform a, a certain number of tricks, which I will present to you later. So. We, we said, okay, probably Fanny is not doing this cooling stuff for nothing. So we will test the cooling, but we will also try this far easier method, which is working without cooling. And this is a picture of the cooled variant. And as I said, we wanted something that is really small scale for individual beekeepers. So we came up, or Eduard came up mostly, Eduard, the guy who's listening to us now, he came up with his styrofoam box uh, which is actually relatively simple. It's simple, it's just six uh, pieces of styrofoam screwed together with some gliding doors in front and the mating nukes are placed inside this box um, and the gliding doors are going up uh, at the time when the uh, queens are supposed to fly out and the cooling is switched off at this time. And the cooling is uh, put in place with a household freezer, which is here. So it's a dis disused uh, model that we had standing around in our institute. And we thought, well, we can use it for that. It is uh, branched to this styrofoam box. And there's a small ventilator pulling the cold out of this freezer into the box. There's a lot of water bottles in the, uh, in the freezer, which uh, of course freeze through during the night. So they are full of ice during the day and the cold inside this a uh, stock of ice is actually present uh, even during very hot weather. So we had a 
over 30 degrees Celsius uh, during the test, and we were able to keep the temperature of around 18 degrees here in the box. And then we had another version, which is the small, uh, which is the non-refrigerated version, because we, we thought that, well, cooling is nice, maybe it's required, but if we can do without cooling, that will be better because then we save energy and time. And so um, we designed this uh, type of mating nucleus. This is a standard Kirchheiner mating nucleus. Maybe you know this model of mating nuke. And uh, uh, the, the only thing that is not standard here is that it has two flight holes, as you can see here. One of the flight holes is just an ordinary hole. It's just uh, an open hole in the wall through which light can fall into the box, while the other hole is actually separated from the main body of the box by this kind of labyrinth. And uh, here is also a queen excluder, so the queen cannot use uh, this exit. And this labyrinth exit is actually the one that is open during the day. So during the time that the queen is not allowed to fly. And this direct opening is opened at the time the queen is supposed to fly out. And at that time, light falls in, attracts the queen to the exit, and the queen comes out really quickly. Here is a, a photograph of the same thing. Uh, this is the labyrinth. It is laying at the bottom of the of the uh, mating box. Uh, you can even place some sugar dough if you need to feed your colonies, you can place some sugar dough uh, over the labyrinth. So this is what it looks like in action. And I hope that you will be able to see the video. Um, now we can, what we will see is that uh, this gliding mechanism here uh, is switching and maybe you saw it now this hole is open before this hole was open now this hole is open so now the light is falling into the uh, mating box and soon you will see the queen coming out here she is doing some orientation flight and then she will fly off so this part of the machinery here uh, is a small Actuator, it's a small um, motor which is uh, usually used uh, for the control of car doors. So it's really, really cheap because it's produced in, in huge quantities. It costs less than two, two euros a piece. Um, and uh, everything, it, it, it is only there to actually move this small piece of plastic, which is opening and closing the two holes alternatively. Eduard designed all of this. Here's just another picture of it. This is the implementation in this bee yard of Mr. Skerka in Priot. Here you can see the queen coming back from a mating flight. And uh, because we thought it would be nice uh, if nobody needed to be around, uh, well, we designed a, a kind of automatization for it. So there is a small microprocessor. We use the microprocessor, which is called Arduino, which can be programmed for all kinds of things. It's relatively easy to program. And uh, it is used to just switch this small actuator here on and off. And you can program the timing, of course. So in this test in Mr. Skerka's BR, we had four colonies with what we call desirable drones. Uh, so these were dark uh, drones of the dark bee, Apis mellifera mellifera. Within the same apiary, apiary, there were about 15 other Apis mellifera mellifera colonies and two Conica colonies, but there were 30 Buckfast colonies at a distance of around 800 meters. Now, most of you know that actually, if you release a queen in a, in a given location, she will normally not mate on the spot, but she will prefer to mate at some distance from her own apiary. So actually 800 meters is just around this distance which queens normally travel before they get mated. Of course, drones also have to be regulated. So the desirable drones, these four colonies of, of drones also had to be regulated. And we did that with this kind of mechanism. So these uh, brownish, 
boxes. They represent the, the hive boxes of the uh, drone colonies. And there was in every, in each drone colony, there were two flight holes again, like for the queens. One of the flight holes was above a queen excluder, which is here. And one was below the queen excluder. And actually the, the hive body, which is here below the excluder, it's just an empty hive body. So all the colonies in here, and this is only empty space. And uh, if this flight hole is open, then the workers can get out because they can crawl through the, uh, the excluder. While uh, when the other uh, flight hole is open, then there is direct access of light into the box. Drones will get out in, in huge quantities very quickly. Actually, this keeping out light but during the times that the queens or drones are not supposed to fly is really important because if you do not keep out light, they risk killing themselves in the attempt of getting through the, the excluder grid. So it's really important to shield everything from light. So we did the, the experiment in three rounds. We brought three sets of queens over the whole summer. Uh, it wasn't a huge experiment, it was supposed to well help beekeepers, so there was a total of 72 queens being installed there. And uh, here are the mating efficiencies, so just the number of queens that were mated, so that produced some female offspring. Uh, you can see that uh, in the control, uh, we had around 83% mating efficiency, which is quite normal. And uh, in the cooled version, so the version with the styrofoam box, we only had 42% uh, mating efficiency, which is definitely suboptimum. In the non-cooled version, however, we had 75%. So that was almost indistinguishable from the control. So apparently there was a problem with the cooled version in that queens uh, did not get mated so frequently. Actually, we found out later that part of this problem was related to uh, the flight entrances being too close to each other. We, could, we, uh, were, we were able to observe uh, one or two queens who uh, entered the wrong flight hole after coming back from, from their mating flights. So that seemed to be one of the problems at least. But there seemed to be other problems as well because we had this low uh, mating efficiency also in repetitions of this cool version that we will talk of later. This is for the number of sperm that we found in the spermatheca of the queens. And as you can see, it's all relatively normal. There seem to be a, a slightly lower number of sperm in the spermatheca of the non-cooled uh, version. Um, we found this repeatedly. So it's, although it is not significant here, I think it, it is uh, relevant in a way because we found it repeatedly. Uh, and I think it might be due to overheating because we know that sperm and also the transfer of sperm from the oviducts to the spermatheca are uh, very sensitive to heat. So we think that this non-cooled version could have this slight disadvantage of, well, possibly causing moderate damage to sperm or at least to the efficiency of sperm transfer. But maybe more important is the mating purity. So whether we actually have the right drones in the matings. And what we see here is uh, the proportion of offspring, so of worker bees that were produced from, the, from these matings that we uh, did. Uh, that had a cubital index, which was atypical of the race that we were trying to keep pure, which was the dark bee. And in artificial insemination, you can see that we still had some uh, atypical cubital indices. This is not unusual. Normally, uh, even if you have a very pure mating, there's always some deviation. Um, in the control, of course, so uh, the queens that were allowed to mate freely without any mating control, we had a lot of deviant uh, morphotypes. Uh, in the cooled version of our moonshine mating of the delayed flight time approach, actually the ratio was much lower, really much lower. 
And in the non-cooled version, it was in between. So the non-cooled version was not as pure as the, pu the cooled version, which is a pity because if you remember from the uh, uh, previous slide, uh, the, the non-cooled version was actually working better in terms of efficiency, but it worked a little less good in terms of purity. This is the same for the hair length. It's actually a very similar image, so I'm not going to talk about it very long. Uh, this is actually the same data again, but it is another view at this data. Uh, before, we had uh, an average of all the queens that we uh, observe or that we measured. Uh, this is now one bar for every queen, for each queen. So each queen has one bar here, because as a breeder, uh, you're interested in the number of queens which are purely mated. This is actually what decides over the success of the mating control. If all of your queens are almost purely mated and you have no purely mated queens for the next generation of your breeding program, a breeding program then the process of mating control is not good enough. But if 80% of your queens are unpurely mated and just 20% are pure, then at least you have something to go on for the next generation. And here, the, the yellow bars, they're from the control. And um, you see that they have relatively elevated cubital indices, typical of, uh, partly typical of Conica almost, although all the queens, of course, were a pure mellifera. The black ones are with uh, moonshine mating, but with the uncooled version, you can see that the results are rather variable. There are some nice low values, especially here, but there are also some clearly deviant values here. And the blue boxes are from for the cool version. And in the cool version, actually, we had quite a lot of nice queens. Uh, the ones behind here, they are the artificial insemination control. And this is actually the area of cubital index that you would expect in the case of a pure mellifera to mellifera mating. And you can see that some of our queens uh, are actually, some of our controlled mating queens are actually quite good. So they're really within the, um, the, uh, the, the area that you, the, you would expect from a pure mating. So that was for the small scale solution. Uh, and now I'm talking about another experiment, which is actually the same experiment, but at a bigger scale. And we did that in an isolated location, which is normally used as a mating station, as a classical mating station, an isolated mating station. And uh, why did we chose isolated location? Uh, because actually our technique was supposed to, well, get rid of this need to have an isolated place for, for mating control. We did this because this isolated location allowed us to control the number and also the genetics of the undesirable drones. We could put as many undesired drones as we wanted uh, and uh, also test the influence of this quantity or this number of undesired drones on the success of our mating control technique. So again, we tested some cooled and some uncooled nuclei. And this is what it all looked like in 2021. We did it also in 2020, but I'm only going to talk here about 21 because otherwise the talk would be too long. So here we had our cooled version. Uh, and as funny, uh, we used uh, uh, actually a cooling cabinet. It is, it is a trailer. It is a, a cooling trailer. It is something that is normally used to, to transport food uh, around. So uh, there was electricity on this clearing so we were able to branch the electric cooling of this trailer and we had a railway system branched to the trailer so that all the mating boxes could be brought in and out uh, really quickly and with little effort and then we had our uh, drone hives the regulated drone hives they're standing here on the right side uh, you can see that they're regulated by the fact that they have from the fact that they have these black boards in in front of their flight holes with the two different flight holes. And in the middle, there are our uncooled uh, mating boxes. So everything is really close together. And we paid attention to the fact that 
the drone hives were receiving shadow during the day and uh, direct sunlight only in the late afternoon hours because, uh, well, as the drones are not allowed to fly, uh, we thought it might be better to have them in the shadow a little while the sun was really burning from the sky. <clears throat> this is actually the implementation in 2020. In 2020, we used uh, bigger mating boxes. I'm not going to talk too much about the difference of the bigger and the smaller boxes, but actually, I think it's an, uh, an interesting topic for questions. If you want to question me about that, I'll be glad to answer. This is uh, my little red car who died during this experiment because this these frequent aller-retour uh, in the forest, my car didn't like it too much, so it broke down shortly afterwards. And maybe you are astonished why we had electricity in the middle of the forest, and that is thanks to this gentleman. Maybe, maybe some of you remember him. It's uh, Erich Honecker, the former leader of Eastern Germany. And he frequently went to hunt there at Schorfeide. And because he wanted to hunt, uh, he wanted to see the deer while he shot them. Uh, he had some electricity installed there for his illumination of the hunting scene. So thanks to this gentleman, we were able to do this experiment. This is just to show you the most impressive uh, aspect of this experiment. This is something that I really enjoyed a lot about this experiment, this moment when the drones were released. Because when these panels go down and the drones come out, what you will hear is a, a, an immediate filling of the air with this typical humming sound that you can find on drone congregation areas. So it's really in within seconds you will have this intense humming noise which is filling the the place completely and it's really really impressive and i'll, I'll try to share it with you so this is just normal worker flight and now the flight holes are being opened for the drones and you can see the drones coming out currently they waited already behind the the, the panel and you can see the drones coming out. I'm not sure whether the sound is coming through very well, but maybe you can hear this sudden typical drone humming filling the air. Okay, that's, that's for the sensual uh, impression. Of course, we also had undesirable drones, I would call them here, or disturbing drones. So those drones that we placed there on purpose in order to spoil our experiment, uh, because we wanted to prove that actually the moonshine mating is working in the presence of massive amounts of non-wanted drones. So we put 10 strong colonies of Apis mellifera carnica, which were especially filled with many, many drone comps. So they were really full of drones. They were placed there uh, on the same uh, location, a little, a little further away. But for drones, this is really no distance to fly. <clears throat> and then, of course, you can imagine that for this moonshine technique to work, uh, a very critical point is to find the right moment to release the queens and the wanted drones. And in order to uh, screen the presence screen the place for the presence of, of drones before we released the queens or we used a quadrocopter. Uh, actually, we also looked at the flight holes of the uh, non-regulated drone colonies in order to see whether there, are, there were still some uh, drones uh, leaving or entering the, these colonies. You can do that as well. But what we found out is that actually uh, you will find drones flying very late in the evening in, in fair weather, but these drones do not seem to participate in matings. So they're just there because maybe they want to defecate or they want to orientate, uh, but they're not actually causing any problems in moonshine mating. Because if you do this test with a quadrocopter, and what we did here is that we brought up a, a, a little bit of, of mating pheromone, uh, in the air with this quadrocopter, we allowed it to hover uh, at an altitude of 25 meters. 
and we waited to see how many drones were accumulating below it. You can see the cluster of drones below the quadrocopter here. So if you do that uh, after 5.30 or 6 in the evening, you will practically not attract any drones anymore, although you can still see many drones flying on the flight halls. So there's a difference between uh, mating readiness and uh, flight in drones. This is one of these uh, surveillance graphs that we did in order to monitor the presence or the activity of drones. Here's the number of drones that we could attract with our pheromone technique. Here's the time before sunset. And as you can see, there is a, a sharp uh, drop here just at around four hours before sunset. And then there's an increase again, and this increase is due to the liberation of the desir desirable drones. So this, those drones that were regulated, those drones that we forced to stay inside during the day, they came out, of course, in great masses once we opened their flight halls. And now we switch directly to some of the results. I'm not going to show all the results because there are some more complicated aspects that I'm just jumping over. I'm just comparing the, those data here that can really be compared because they were done under equal circumstances. So here we have the controls. I'm sorry, I forgot to translate here. I last gave this talk in French. So here we have the controls without any mating control. And you can see again that the cubital index is really quite high in many cases. And here are the uh, controlled matings without refrigeration, so without cooling, and here with cooling. And uh, here is the, the area again that you would expect in the case of pure mellifera matings. And uh, yeah, what you can see is that actually we have quite a, a number of queens, this one, this one, maybe this one, maybe even this one, this one, this one, which possibly are pure. Of course, this would need to be uh, verified by other methods. Uh, actually, we're just waiting for the results of our molecular verification of this mating purity. So I cannot tell you the definite uh, answer about the purity of these queens, but we're quite certain that they're quite pure. We also checked the, the hair length and uh, it seems to be really relatively pure material that we're obtaining here. And again, it seems like uh, there is a little more homogeneity in the refrigerated group uh, compared to the unrefrigerated group. Uh, here is the percentages of mated queens again. So the, the, the mating efficiency, as you might call it. Uh, as I said, we did it in two years, 2020 and 2021. Uh, in the cool version, again, we had relatively low mating efficiency, so a relatively low number of queens uh, that got mated at all. Uh, in the non-cooled version, this proportion was a little higher. We, didn't have, we did not test a non-cooled in 2020, but in 2021, it was a little higher. And in the control, it was quite normal, actually. And the total was 177 queens that we tested at this mating station. So I hope I could convince you that actually you can exert control over mating with this delayed flight time method. Now the question is for what price? And uh, here I, I just put together uh, based on informations that uh, Eduard gave me uh, about the materials that he bought to buy these uh, special uh, mating nukes. Uh, and actually the highest cost is just for the normal uh, mating nukes, so the, the new mating nukes that you, that you buy, that you would also buy if you uh, would not do moonshine mating. So this just, these are just the normal Kirchheiner styrofoam boxes. And uh, then the second highest post um, is for these uh, little motors that we use to uh, move the, uh, the, the sliding doors uh, to the left and to the right, or to the up uh, or up and down, actually, in the case of the drone colonies. And then there's also some money you have to spend on these microprocessors, of course. There's uh, <clears throat> some money you have to spend on the 
uh, woods and screws so that in total, if you want to mate around 100 queens a season, you would have to invest around 1,200 euros. But this is without your own labor costs. So if you uh, put in your own labor, of course, well, if you calculate the cost for your own labor, it's all going to be much more expensive. Uh, actually, uh, you save a lot of labor if you 3D print uh, your uh, uh, gliding doors. So the gliding doors for the uh, mating boxes, they can be really nicely 3D printed. Eduard has just designed a really wonderful model, which is very economical in, in materials. So you can print one for less than one euro. And uh, Eduard will, will be glad to, to share this model with you in case you want to, to print your uh, uh, moonshine mechanisms for your mating boxes. They're universal, so they can be branched to every type of mating box that you might have. Or almost every type, I suppose. So to conclude on the delayed flight time method, and as I said, uh, some of the conclusions are a little preliminary because we're still awaiting the molecular uh, analysis. The success is variable, variable but there is success. Uh, there clearly is uh, mating control taking place. The automatization uh, really allows you to lower the workload uh, quite tremendously because you do not have to be there every evening. You just switch on the thing and it works for you. It's really reliable, at least uh, for this uncooled version. For the cooled version, for the uh, trailer that we use, this cooling trailer, automatization did not work quite as well. So this is something that needs improvement. But for the uncooled version, the free a standing um, mating boxes, the, uh, automatization is really working great. What we did not manage to do, what we had actually had hoped we could do is, we would, did not manage to uh, quantify the influences of di different weather conditions on, on the optimum opening time of uh, the queen boxes, especially, uh, because some people who had worked with the technique before had told us that if there is rain during the day then, and then the rain stops, uh, then the free flying drones will also fly a little later than usual because they had to stay inside as well because of the rain. So in this case, uh, you should either not let your queens fly at all or let them fly a little later. So this is this, this kind of things we were just not able to, to really uh, study at all because there wasn't enough time there wasn't enough weather vari variability also we also had we almost always had fair weather the cooling reduces the mating efficiency but it increases the purity which is uh not so easy to explain maybe we can discuss it later it also tends to increase the number of sperm in the spermatheca and this is actually something really nice uh i think this is because uh, well, there might be some overheating in these small boxes if they're standing in the sunlight. Actually, we also found that uh, we had a greater number of sperm in the spermatheca of the cooled boxes also compared to the control boxes. So the boxes which were not suffering any mating control at all. So where the queens were allowed and the workers were allowed to fly out during the day uh, as much as they wanted. So even there, we had a slight reduction of the number of sperm as compared to the cooled version. So actually cooling seems to be really nice for sperm transfer or sperm survival. In fair weather, the best moment for releasing the queens is around 3.15 before sunset. And this is something we found out and we tested it once and again, it seems to be the right time. So pure matings are possible despite the presence of great numbers of foreign drones with this technique. And so we hope that we have done something useful and that some of you might, might want to give it a try. We have really a lot of interest from, from uh, breeders from, from different countries already. And uh, some of them are trying to uh, make it, uh, to create an industrial version of, this, of these mating boxes. And some of them are going back to doing everything by hand because they don't like the automatization. But actually, this is the nice thing. It's just 
it's very easy to understand how it works and everybody can just improvise uh, how he think he can implement it best. Um, just one of the last slides is just about the comparison with other methods of mating control. So the classical mating station and the artificial insemination. Uh, in terms of effort, we think that actually uh, the effort required for, for moonshine mating is more or less comparable to the effort you put in uh, to the mating uh, in ordinary mating stations. Actually, if you have only a few queens to mate, then definitely moonshine mating is a better choice. If you have many queens, maybe a different situation. Uh, costs are definitely a big plus for the mating, uh, for the moonshine mating, because it's cheaper than artificial insemination. And it's probably also cheaper than uh, mating stations, because you do not have to rent huge areas and you do not have to pay beekeepers to keep the right material around you and so on. The purity, the mating purity that you can achieve uh, is probably uh, the downside of this delayed flight time method. You can have very pure matings, but it's not really absolutely predictable uh, and you have to make compromises, it's clear. Uh, the dependency on geographical conditions is one of the advantages, an advantage that, of course, moonshine mating shares with artificial insemination, which can, which can be done almost everywhere. Uh, so this is something nice. So this is just to give you a perspective about other methods of mating control that may be coming soon, or that we hope might come soon. Actually, Eduard is uh, doing a lot in order to make them come sooner. And uh, of course, what we're all dreaming of is to have a, a natural mating in closed rooms. So just release your queens and drones uh, in, a, in a room with given dimensions, with a given, given setting in order to uh, have them mate. And in that way you can control, of course, which queen is present and which drones are present. So you have total control over the mating process. But until now, this has not been possible because the drones and queens just refuse to mate in uh, closed uh, locations. Uh, so what we are doing right now at the Institute is we're, we have designed a, a flight simulator for drones where the drones are in attachment and we try to uh, replay different components of mating stimulus, stimuli, or what we think might, might be components of mating stimuli. We, we, we are replaying these components in this flight simulator and just see how the drones react, just see how the queens react, whether we can make the drones orient towards the queens more efficiently if these stimuli are present or not. So this is the work of Eduard for, uh, of Eduard's PhD actually. This is all that I wanted to tell you today. My thanks go to all these people who helped within the project and from outside, to the Federal Ministry, of course, for funding. And of course, for you, for, to you for, for listening so patiently. And I hope you have some questions for me and for Edith Wright. So that was great. Well, how insightful. I'm very glad. Thank you very much. And hello. Hello. Eva. hello. <laughs> so please, everybody might uh, put your questions down in the Q&A box below. You all know, know the drill. And I, of course, to have some questions. I start from like, the end of the presentation. Did you find some stimuli? <clears throat> Sorry, did we find some what? Stim stimuli, you know, in your flight simulator. Start, ah, yeah, I start okay. in the end and go forward. <laughs> Questions. Okay, Eduard, this is for you. Yes. Yeah. So there are se several stimuli we are testing. So they are, uh, and which are really defining the uh, response of the drones coming from the uh, phototactic stimuli. So the, the drones are phototactic, so they're responding to the light, definitely. And uh, with the drone simulator, they seem to respond also to the motion, so the, the moving objects. 
Mm-hmm. Um, another thing is the chemotactic as well. So they seem responsive to the hype order. So if you um, give uh, bringing them into the space, which is artificial, like this um, uh, the simulator uh, chamber. And however, from the one side, you are providing a, a tiny plume of the order um, from the hive. And so they are also responsive. So they are changing the directivity of flight and the flying towards the, um, uh, uh, the aroma source of their familia. Hmm. And so, that's, yeah. in, that's interesting. Although you might think that, you know, it makes them non-responsive as they don't want to mate within the hive. So that's kind of... But unexpected. It's, exactly. It's, it's still a far away to claim that they're in the mating mood, so in mating modules. Okay. So, so um, I would say that they're in the condition that so they um, to familiarize uh, themselves with the environment, so and try to orient in order to find where they are and how to in order to find a home. So so we can review their um, their capability capabilities as the code. So like. If something is like this, so execute following actions. So, and uh, of course, the artificial environment is causing the great stress for them. And so that's why we have to really precisely uh, evaluate every single detail in order to really evaluate uh, mm-hmm. properly whether they're in the mating models or they're just uh, basically stressed and trying to um, uh, find some clues in order to return back home. Mm-hmm. That's- that Actually, will be great. Maybe you'll find you'll find the right stimuli. We have a lot of um, ideas how to identify and isolate some of them. Still more to come. So there are questions. Uh, Thomas Morrison asks: Is it necessary to close off the daytime flight entrance? Like, could you also leave it open? Like both. I understand. It. The question is: Could you leave both entrances open? Now you closed one and reopened the other one. Could you leave them open both? I think, um, actually we did not try, but I think that there will be a problem if you uh, leave it open uh, in the form of queens trying to enter the wrong one. And uh, because the the other one is equipped with a queen excluder um, and it is also relatively deep uh, inside uh, the hive. So this queen excluder is actually deep inside the hive. I think what the, what will happen is that the queen will run in or will run into the wrong entry and uh, will try to get through the excluder. Some workers will get out to her uh, and she will not try to find another uh, entrance because she thinks, well, I'm inside the hive, but she cannot actually reach the comps. So mm-hmm. this is not a, a desir- desirable situation. So I think it's better to to close and open them alternatively. Okay. So Pablo Espejo, Espejo, I hope I pronounced that correct, asks, he says, excellent work and excellent presentation. Congratulations. And he asks, regarding the efficiency of fecundation, did you remark if the bees are accepting well the queens or they tend to replace them? Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the thing is that um, most of the queens that we uh, that we made it in our experiments, they were sacrificed afterwards in order to uh, one uh, count the sperm in the spermatheca and two uh, detect the purity of the semen because we're actually doing the uh, the genotyping from the semen from the spermatheca. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we. Uh, gave around 20 queens uh, to some uh, dark bee breeders from our region and they overwintered them and they said they make excellent colonies. So, but there is um, one breeder who uh, replicated the method this season. And he says that uh, some of the queens that he made it in his apiary, they were replaced. So apparently the filling of the spermatheca wasn't really great. Okay. That's all I can say. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm. So John Dukash uh, asks, many evenings in summer here in Scotland, the temperature may drop quite quickly. How does this affect moonshine matings? Mm-hmm. 
That's a good question. We, we only validated the thing for our region because, well, well that was basically our mission. Uh, I suppose that if the temperature is falling really quickly, then the period that you have available for moonshine mating will be shorter. Uh, and this may mean that um, you will have less purity because you're forced to let them out a little earlier. Uh, but this is something that really requires experimentation on the location where you want to do it. And still the summers should be, like the days should be longer in Scotland in summer than in Central Europe, like it's far further north. Maybe it has something to do with the presence of the sea, I don't know. Yes, and yeah. Uh, however, the issue could be, I think, also solved with the density of the drones. So, um, releasing the higher density for the moonshine, a group of drones, are, of course, could suppress the domestic drones present. So, and also the conditions we applied. So, we uh, the drones from the control group and the and the moonshine drones. So, so they were uh, really close to each other, and the number of colonies was. Uh, that, that was like more, more than 10 for, for some cases of the control group. So those extreme conditions, I think that's not usually, not, not, that, not that often that the beekeepers who are doing the breeding um, experiments and uh, processes, so they are that surrounded uh, heavily with uh, different species. Yeah. And I think the question arises there, uh, at what temperature can you still let your queens and drones fly? until what temperature? And might there be a difference between different subspecies? We always claim that the dark bee is flying at lower temperatures. We didn't compare the, the subspecies with that regard. What mm -hmm. we can say is that they definitely do not fly if the temperatures are below 20 degrees, I would say. So okay. um, you really need to have at least two or three warm days within the 10 or 12 days that the mating uh, colonies mm. stay in the mating station. So warm nights they, they need, at least yeah. 20 degrees, okay. Yeah, but we also had some reports of the dark bee breeders that we worked with, uh, who told us that they had drones really late in the season, which which my, may indicate that they're uh, coping with cooler weather a little better than the, the gray drones. Mm. Uh, I think this is really, really interesting. I would really like to do a, a dedicated study about that. Yeah, that would be cool. So there's Alice Pinter. Hi, Alice. She says, hi, Jacob. Congratulations for the excellent and insightful work and talk. Now I understand better the material we have for genotyping and the pressure for getting out the molecular results is even stronger. So you sent some some tests to Alice to do the genetics as well, not only morphometry. Yes, yes, I'm afraid we gave we gave her a really bad time because there's really a tiny amount of, of tissue, of course, only these three or four million cells. Uh, so <laughs> Alice is, is really struggling with our samples, but I hope that we will get good results. Well, she says, we will do our best to deliver the results ASAP. <laughs> and the question, <laughs> that's good, thanks, Alice, for next year's talk, at least. So a question, are the samples that we receive for genotyping from the cool or uncooled experiments group, like? Uh, they're both. both. They're both. Okay. Yeah, so actually, Alice got all the samples that we had. Okay. Except those that went to the millifera breeders. <laughs> and then Roman in our uh, Ask. Thank you for the presentation. Do you have any idea how far away mating happens when you release them for the moonshine mating compared to normal matings? But I guess you didn't test the distance. I don't know. Actually, we don't. We know that our queens tend to be back really quickly, so within within five or ten minutes. So they tend to be back more. Uh, uh, faster than, than uh, during normal mating time. So I suppose that this means that they mate uh, closer by, mm. uh, but we're not sure about that. Yeah, okay. 
And then Loka, John Duka, Durkas asks uh, do, if you have records of evening temperatures. Of evening temperatures? Yes. Yes, yes, you record. yes. yes we have records, but I don't have them right now. But yeah, of course, we have records. So if he's interested in that, just write me an email. Okay, that's good. If you cannot find his email, John, you just write an email to Sigam and we will set you up. Okay, we will connect you. And Matis Hermans asked an interesting talk. Thank you. I want to try moon, moonlight mating this year. How often did you teach the drones to fly before mating? And how many days old were the queens when they first fly out? And I will add to that question, how many times do you release them for flight? Mm -hmm. So actually, we're oh, um, what we do is that we install them when they're relatively young. So the queens are installed when they're two to three days old. They, they go to the mating station. And uh, if they're, um, and then they're just, they're allowed to fly out. Of course, they will not fly out on the first day, but then we, we just naturally let them uh, initiate their, their mating flights as soon as they feel mature, so to speak. Uh, as for the drones, uh, usually we allowed them to fly for two or three days before we brought the first queens. But after that, I mean, it's a, it's like a circle. I mean, the uh, first group of queens arrive and then uh, we wait for 10 days and then we bring the second group of queens and it's always the same drones, basically, or some drones will hatch, some new drones will hatch, of course, but it's like a permanent um, renewal of the drones so that's they're trained in the process we don't train them train on, training on the job <laughs> yeah, exactly and he also asked do you think it is a problem to have the drone colonies of wormbo wormbo bambo ah bambo yeah ah, so uh, bambo means that the comps are standing uh, parallel to the flight entrance uh, and not vertical to the flight entrance. I, I don't think so. I don't think it's a problem. The, the important thing is that you have good aeration from below, of course. Yeah, so the Vamba helps for uh, light, like with the light. It blocks out more of the light than with the Kaltbau. Yes, maybe. Maybe it could be useful even. Yeah, we, we always use Kaltbau because that's what we usually do, but yeah, maybe. Bamba was even better in that respect. Yeah. Okay. And Vasa adds, so you don't let the queens training to fly before the mating day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, if you put them on a mating station with two days, they're not mature and they can fly. So, and how long do you leave them on the mating station? Uh, usually we, we leave them for 10 days and uh, if there is uh, a lot of bad weather, but as I said, this happened relatively rarely within our two years of experiments, um, then we give them an extra one or two days so that they have at least three days of fair weather. And that's enough. So two days plus three for maturity. So that leaves them with a week of mating. And yeah, if the weather is fair, that should be, mm -hmm. should be right. Yeah. And however, they are able to leave the first day they are placed because the program, the automation uh, program, so it's activated from the first day. Same for the drones. So they, um, they have um, evening time to, to fly and to, to spread the wings, to, to stretch them. And same for the, for the queens. So the duration of 10 days, so they are not staying is isolated close. So they are able to leave. Yeah, they can go every evening, they can go and try. Exactly. And the program is loop, so it, it, it repeats uh, the same uh, sequence of action every every day. So if you open it, like uh, Jakob mentioned, so 5.30, mm -hmm. like uh, three, three hours before the sunset, and, and the clo uh, in the closing time, which is really important, so uh, right after the sunset, so in order to minimize a possible scenario when she's stuck somewhere or or being cut with the mechanism or so, something like this. So that's that prevents it a hundred percent. Thank you, Edouard. So and then Vasai asks again or says, hello Jacob, hello Edouard. 
Thanks for this presentation. It is a very interesting experiment and ready for helping breeders to avoid hybridization situation. How did you settle the number of father colonies? Do you think that eight drone colonies are sufficient for having diff diversity in the queen's offsprings? Yes, well, you need at least seven matings in a queen, they say, right? I think that actually, if you have eight, that is hugely sufficient. Uh, maybe you remember that in the early days of mating stations, uh, people used to work with a single uh, drone colony in a mating station. And actually they were happy as long as they didn't bring too many queens. And uh, of course we know today that this method is not optimum because the genetic diversity within the colony is important for colony fitness. But I think as long as you have more than two or three, uh, that's okay. The problem is that you, had, you need a lot of drones. So uh, if you only have two colonies, then moonshine mating will not work. You will have too few drones. You need a, a, a minimum drone pressure in order to have a mating. And uh, so what we, the minimum that we worked with was, was four. Four seem to, be, seem to be working okay, but it means that all four have to be full of drones. If you have one which is a little weakish, or which kicks out the drones too early, then you might have a problem. So it's better to have five if you work with a smaller apiary. For the waiting stations, we had eight to 10 always. Well, to have five drone colonies, but it's just more about the diversity in the population or in your breeding stock than uh, the problem of the diversity within the queen, right? Oh, he adds, thanks for the answer. I mean, I meant intercolony diversity because eight drone hives equal eight mother queens. Yes. Yeah, okay. I mean, in, in the classical uh, mating station system, what you do is that all the drone colonies are actually headed by sister queens. So there you have a diversity, but uh, it's actually all uh, reflecting the diversity of one grandmother queen, so to speak, or grandmother colony. And uh, so there you don't have a lot of variation. In our experiment, we had more variation than that because uh, our uh, queens, we didn't care too much about their uh, origin. We only cared about their uh, subspecies purity because we wanted to be able to distinguish between the right and the wrong offspring. And uh, so we, we took a, a great care to make sure that they were all pure, but we did not take care of the a relationship between them too much. So mm. there was more diversity than in the normal mating station setting. Mm. Well, it's always good to have a, a larger diversity rather than a, a too small one. We didn't have too good experiences over time with like sister queen drone colonies, but you know, it always depends the, the gen genetic diversity of your stock in general. Okay. Yeah, so I have um, thought about, ah, uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's my song, that's good. I have also thought about when you were showing that flight simulator, you, you noticed that that intrigued me a lot. <laughs> I was thought, thinking about this paper about all the saying, I cannot remember if it was really in action, if it was just a rumor that there was a wind funnel mating. And I think it was reported, it wasn't a paper. Do, do you have any knowledge of that or any experience even with it? Oh. Uh, there are many rumors of, of uh, closed location uh, matings and uh, we, we found many reports in old beekeeping journals and Eduard during his first, the first year of his PhD he tried to build some of these uh, devices. Uh, we called it the love cabin. <laughs> Eduard, do you want to talk about it? Exactly, so the first year, yeah, so we we tried many techniques and yeah, so I think uh, the people that claim that it happens like in some closed environment, this mating or like you said that there's the uh, tunnel mating and or the um, 
closed uh, net-based uh, cages mating. Um, of course, if the mating would occur, it would be a big, um, uh, like a big news, yeah. So, like uh, astonishing. That definitely would repeat it and try to publish. So that would uh, attract a lot of attention. Uh, so we we repeated that there was nothing even close. So they were not interesting. So of course, the mating occurs uh, in the high air. So the the drones and queen to should have enough. A sufficient degree of uh, freedom to to fly to kind of to be exposed to all kind of um, stimuli and um, environmental uh, factors which are uh, suitable for for the weather uh, suitable weather and other factors so that's why um yeah so if it, if, if it would happen so we would definitely know and it would be like a big okay. scientific program behind it so yeah. So did you try with the wind in a funnel as well? That was reported that they need, you know, the wind it makes them fly and, you know, then maybe together with some imagery. <laughs> yeah, so we tried you... some, some different techniques. We also built some uh, olfactor meters where we uh, tried to, to have a, an attachment flight so that the drones being attached or the free flying. So, yeah, they, they show some, uh, some, um, some kind of scenario where they fly and seem to orient, but however, in this indoor environment, the artificial environment, so they they really switching their senses to be more phototactic, so they they're responsive to the light. So I think they're really desperate. They want initially to evaluate where they are, so uh, in order to proceed further with other uh, actions. Um, I think it's not yet realistic, but however, so we are we are really reaching closer to the. To the point um, where we can really isolate it. So, and I think the next summer we will have a really couple of big experiments. Uh, first experiment to really evaluate the environmental factors, which are really activating the mating behavior, uh, and also, and also so to uh, evaluate, we build them setup which can closely show us what happens in the drone clusters in the free flight when whenever the uh, drones are meeting the queens uh, so that uh, would yeah, open a lot of cards in the coming in the coming summer mm. well we're sure looking forward to your next presentation so the next at the next conference uh, i see there's still a lot more to go and i hope you succeed in finding this you know stimulus that would be very interesting uh, to see hope you succeed good luck Edouard. and to you too, Jakob, and thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. <laughs> Good to, to have you here. So we wish everybody um, else goodbye and also say, well, thank you for joining. There will be um, three more talks, one from Joe Widicom next week, and there will be a Russian talk about a Baskorian population. And then last but not least will be Birgit from Hohenheim, Birgit Gessler, about the VSH, VSH uh, program, some genetic um, analysis as a final. And then the conference is over. So three more to go. And thank you very much for tonight. And we say you all goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye.